what's happened? Absolutely. Is, is that a critical thing to an effective response from an institution? Not in my opinion. Sorry. Oh, you're saying is it critical? Oh, you're saying is it important? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Is it, is it one of the primary, as it were, factors that must be found in any system of response? For a faith-based organization, I think it, they, how the person feels about being able to come forward and how they're treated once they're coming forward is absolutely essential. Why just faith-based? Why isn't that true of any organization? It, it, the difficulty is, because I work with so many organizations that... Um, I work with so many organizations that don't have the resources to have that set up for themselves, the social service organizations that um, are going to need to use an, an outside entity to be able to come forward. They might not be fully equipped to, to have a program for someone to come into or to be prepared for that to come forward to them. Well, even then, shouldn't they have in place a process, even if it involves engaging an outside organisation? Absolutely. They have in place a process which allows a child or an adult survivor the capacity to come and feel safe in reporting? Yes, definitely. And, that, and that's partly about being child-centred, about making the, the, the child or the survivor feel safe and secure, but it's, it's also to do, I suppose, with achieving an environment where full disclosure uh, is, is possible or more likely. You're asking if part of the way you create a victim or survivor-centered response system is to create an environment where people feel comfortable to disclose. Is that so right? well, I'm saying there, there are two reasons why one may, or perhaps there are many others, there are at least two reasons why one may, why it's important to create that environment. One would be to, for the health and well-being of the survivor. But another and related one is, is that in that environment, they're more likely to be able to disclose what actually happened so that the organization can, can properly deal with it. Would that be right? Yes. We could probably come up with other reasons as well. And would another aspect of, of best practice be an ability by the organization to take effective child safe action once a report has been made and, and uh, upheld? It, it really depends on the organization. Uh, for example, a school may not be able to take child safe action themselves. They have to rely on child welfare entities to assist them with that. So. Would it be right then either an ability themselves to take child safe action or uh, a relationship with other authorities that have that ability? Yes. And the question of how is the child going to be safe is, is a question that must be answered. And that, and that would depend on uh, the facts justifying it. In other words, if, if they were on the information available, uh, the reasonable conclusion was that abuse had taken place, then the organization should have the ability to act on it, etc. I don't think that's what I'm saying, um, merely because many times when it's time for an organization to make a report to the child welfare authorities, the facts of the matter haven't yet been established. All right. Um, yeah, that's, that's an important qualification so far as reporting is concerned. I, I see that insofar as the organization taking its own action, uh, child safe action internally is concerned, uh, that ability would be required once sufficient facts are available to determine that there has been abuse. Would that be right? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just sort of getting hung up on, the, on whose responsibility it is to take child safe action because... Um, that really varies from the situation, who the perpetrator is, who the child is. and um, So, for example, um, if we're talking about a, a, a resident camp and a child reports abuse out at, a, at, a camp, at an overnight camp, um, 
and the allegation is that the person who's working at the camp has abused, then being able to separate that child from the person who abused them is absolutely has to be part of the response. You don't want to give the person further access to that child. Um, and that's an action that the organization can take. Um, but sometimes, for example, in a school, they make a report, but the child is still going home that day, and the, the report was about a person who abused them at home. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not, in, unless the police say don't send that child home, or the child welfare entity says don't send that child home, then the school can't just say, oh, well, we're taking this child home with us. We're not going to let him go back to that house. I mean, that's... That just can't be done. But the starting point is either the school or the camp or any other institution has to have uh, within its own operation a process which makes it possible for the child or adult survivor to come and tell what happened. Isn't it? That's the starting point. Yes. Uh, that's, I, I think that's a... Uh, and great care has to be taken by the institution to ensure that what it has in place, uh, so far as it can, will ensure that the child or adult survivor will come and tell their story. I, I think when we were talking about, you know, what do we consider part of this current era, I think that that's one of the most critical pieces of the current era. And if an institution doesn't have that, it's seriously failing in its obligation to those within its care, isn't it? If there's not a way for someone to come forward? If there's not a safe way where people children or adults feel they can come forward and report the abuse, then the institution's failing. They wouldn't be meeting the current standards of care. No. And I, I take from what you say, too, that there should be strong and cooperative relationships with child protection authorities. In other words, between the organization and child protection authorities and, indeed, uh, criminal justice authorities, would that be right? Certainly in a country like this, um, it's not, and not in every country is it easy to have strong relationships with the criminal justice system, but um, in a country like this, certainly. <coughs> and in the case of the identification of an offender, to have a proper risk assessment uh, to inform what's then to be done. That would be another important component, wouldn't it? Well, are you talking about on, on the part of the organization? Yes. Yeah, and an offender within the organization. So an example you gave of, a, of someone teaching at camp or let's say a teacher or a minister in a church. Um, there are scenarios where having a risk assessment is critical. Um, but from my perspective, we don't, if a teacher or a minister or someone has behaved improperly across the line with repeated boundary violations and or um, there's been a disclosure of abuse, then that individual continuing to be in a position of trust with children is not acceptable. So there must be a whether there's a risk assessment or not. Um, I, I wouldn't want to have to wait for a risk assessment if we know what the behavior is. <coughs> now, I understand from your um, CV that you have um, given evidence as an expert witness for the Jehovah's Witnesses on previous occasions. Is that right? Yes. Um, three in the U.S. and one in the U.K. That's correct. And in each of those cases was the Jehovah's Witness organization in one form or another a, a defendant? Yes. And those were civil claims for damages arising from abuse, is that right? That's correct. Each of them? I believe so, yes. And I, I take it you were paid for your services? Yes. A, a, as you are today? That's correct. At your usual consultancy rates? Yes. And following any of those cases, have you advised or made recommendations to the Jehovah's Witness organization in whatever formation as to ways in which it can or should change 
or adapt to better meet best practice? Um, what I've done is ask the questions along the way as to particular things that I saw in the case and asked whether or not those had changed, if the scenario had changed, um, had they already um, had they already changed their practices in particular areas, and I can't think of a time when I when I asked anything that they hadn't already resolved. So each of those cases was going back in time, and so they've had quite a few changes to their practices over the past ten years. Have you so. ever given evidence that's critical of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, in, 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 in terms of a lawsuit? Or? In, in, in any forum where you've given evidence, have you given evidence critical of the Jehovah's Witnesses? I, I haven't in a particular, I haven't been hired to do that. I'm sure that when I was testifying or something I wrote, I may have said something that was critical or negative. When you say you haven't been hired to do that, what have you been hired to do? Well, what I was originally hired to do by the Jehovah's Witnesses was just review their literature and ask, they asked me to give my opinion of what it was they were giving as advice and then subsequently they asked me to, um, to review a case and also to provide the testimony regarding my opinions about their literature. And was any of the evidence you've ever given critical of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Not specifically that I know. Have you given evidence in any court case on behalf of any other organisation? I have. Which other organisations have you given evidence on behalf of? Um, the State of Washington Child Welfare System. Anyone else? Um, that's all that I know now. Were you critical of the State of Washington? Oh, um, no, I, well, I was saying that they had met the standards of care. When did you get that evidence? About seven months ago. Seven months. Has the case been decided by the judge? Yes. Oh, what happened? They found for the defense. Oh. Uh, do you know the name of the case? That is the Hamrick, Hamrick versus State of Washington. How do I spell that? H A M R I C K. Which court, which court was it in? Do you know? It, Washington State. Oh. Okay. You've also um, provided uh, testimony, at least by affidavit, uh, in a case for the Boy Scouts of America. Isn't that right? Yes. In September 2013. In, in a court case? In a test court testimony case? United States District Court uh, of Washington uh, by, by affidavit. Oh, okay. At least. I don't know whether there was oral testimony after that. Yes. Yes. For the Boy Scouts. That's right. Are there others where you've, where you've provided written evidence, although you may not have given oral evidence? Yes. There were, for what other organizations? Um, so, for other organizations or other cases? Well, other organizations and then in respect of each of the cases. Okay. Um, because generally what happens if somebody wants me to um, provide expert consulting or expert testimony, then I ask them to send me the case and I review the case and then I tell them morally what I think and then they either ask me to write a report or offer testimony or they don't. And so um, that's generally how I determine or how they determine whether or not they want me to move forward and testify. Well, in respect of those that you, you have given a report yes. uh, to be used in a case for which organizations? Um, There was a, I, I, would have to, I would have to go back to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, well, as best you can remember, Dr. Um, Blunt. Yes, I've offered testimony uh, by way of deposition in a case that was, well, 
it was against a um, it was against the United States government, um, the Defense Department. But in that case, it was testimony for the def for the plaintiff. And um, there was also one that was. I, I just would have to look. I'm sorry. I would have to, to go back to, to my notes. Uh, other than that one you mentioned against the U.S. Government Department of Defense, are there others in which you've acted for the plaintiff? Yes. Um, I can recall one in which uh, it was against a school district uh, in, in which a volunteer had come in and he volunteered and then he stayed and started taking students to the bathroom and he sexually abused them in the bathroom and in that case I testified that they had not met the standard of care. And there's reference in uh, some of the correspondence I see to the, the Baker case. Is that one of the cases that you worked in for the Jehovah's Witnesses? That was for the Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. So what was that case? Um, I, I was asked really to provide testimony regarding the structure and governance of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that was a case in which a, um, a girl was sexually abused by a man who had once been a ministerial servant. Is that, <laughs> is that one of the cases that you refer to as the three in the United States and one in the United Kingdom? Is that, is that one of those? That's the one in the United Kingdom. particular case, when were you first asked, in other words, this hearing, when were you first asked by the Jehovah's Witnesses whether you would provide an opinion? Um, I don't remember the exact date. I'm sure there's a letter, but um, I know that it was just before I left for Australia, so it would have been... Well, I've seen correspondence going back to 25 May. As long ago as that. Okay. Um, it, it could be that that there was something. I, I don't recall it being something that I thought about having to look at until I was preparing to leave for Australia. So it would have been either May or June of this year. <coughs> now, one of the things you mentioned in, in your report is the um, federal court uh, code of practice for uh, expert witnesses that's in paragraph um, 8. You say you've been um, provided with it and you say you've considered all the matters contained in these guidelines when formulating the opinions set out in your statement and you acknowledge that your opinions are based on your expertise as set out above. I mean, are we to understand from that that you consider you've complied with the requirements uh, of that guideline. Yes. I'd like to show that um, guideline to you. Do, do you have a copy of it? We can provide one to you. Thank you. Um, in particular, with regard to par uh, paragraph 2.1, under the heading, the form of the expert's report, do you see that? To, yes. It says an expert's written report must comply with Rule 23.13. I won't trouble you with, with that. And must therefore, uh, sorry, and therefore must. And then there are various requirements there. A, be signed by the expert. B, contain an acknowledgement. Um, and so on. Um, the, the key ones are possibly starting at E. Um, set out separately each of the factual findings or assumptions on which the expert's opinion is based. So do, do you consider in your report you've set out each of the factual findings or assumptions on which your opinion is based? I believe so. And if 
uh, set out separately from the factual findings or assumptions each of the experts' opinions. Uh, do you believe your report sets out your opinion separately from the factual findings and assumptions? Yes, some are set out separately, and um, then I can think of a couple of opinions that are in the same section with what I consider to be the factual bases. All right, we'll, we'll come back to those um, when we look at your report in more detail. And G sets out the reasons for your each of your opinions. So to understand your, or I beg your pardon, to find your reasons, we will find them in the report, is that right? Yes. The reasons for your opinions. Yes. And at 2.3, it says they should be included in or attached to the report the documents and other materials that the expert has been instructed to consider. Now, obviously, in this case, there's quite a volume of material and it's not uh, attached to your report, and we thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> however, what your report might have done, and this is not a criticism, I'm just trying to work out what we're now going to do about this, is identify those materials. So are, are you able to identify for us what materials you've had regard to in formulating uh, the opinions that you state in your report? There are obviously those that are specifically mentioned or referenced, but are there others? The, the one Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like, um, maybe even comment. If you watched it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, Thank you for watching and bye for now.